the one thing you learn from, from the world we live in now is that you've, you've got to be straight about things and assess when you're good and when you're not, right. and, then, and then pivot and change. And so what happened during that, uh, you talked about anxiety. Right. Yeah, it was a pretty big shift. Yeah. And in that shift, there were, there were, you know, there were a few things that we, we did that weren't that great. Welcome to the Nuco Shift Dialogues, where we speak with leaders in business, government, and media the people on the front lines of the greatest shift in business since the Industrial Revolution. Mark Pritchard took over P&G's brand efforts, including the largest marketing budget in the world, just as hundreds of millions of consumers began flocking to Twitter, Facebook, and the iPhone. Over his eight-year tenure, the marketing world, once dominated by mass media, has shifted dramatically. Mark Pritchard joins us to discuss that shift. It's great to have you. You know, yeah. I feel like we spend a lot of time together. And every week, whether we need it or not. <laughs> so P&G is, is almost two centuries old, 180 years old. At 100, um, yeah. It's obviously one of the world's most admired companies. Graduates at business schools love to check a box and work there as a brand manager for at least a few years. Mm -hmm. Some people end up there a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, but I sense from, from knowing you over the past few years, and in particular uh, last year, uh, or this year when we did the Signal Conference, you aren't entirely content with the state of P&G. Can you unpack that for me? Yeah, we're, we're in the middle of a pretty major transformation. And uh, the interesting thing about a company that's almost 180 years old is that about every decade or so, we go through a pretty major transformation. Right. As you know, we're in the middle of, of divesting uh, several of our businesses, and, um, and, and focusing on those businesses, those categories that are the everyday household and personal care products that we, we really know well, yeah. that respond to innovation, that respond to branding with the number one brands like Pampers and, and Always and Tide and Ariel and Pantene and Head and & Shoulders and Gillette and right. Crest and those, the big, the big, big brands right. that respond to branding and innovation and, uh, and really transforming how we operate right. in order to get better. We need to grow more um, and create more value. We've gotten really good at productivity to fuel growth, and, uh, and now we're, we're kind of in the middle of that. Yeah. What does this look like? When you, when you say um, you want to transform, and it's related to a shift in mm -hmm. the way the consumer behaves, you know, what does that shift look like from the consumer standpoint, and what does it look like for the company, what changes actually at the company? Yeah, well, look, just in my world, which is the brand building world, it's dramatically changed because when digital technology started maturing to the point where consumers were constantly connected, right. whether it be first by desktop, now of course by mobile, then that changed the way they communicate with each other and the way they communicate with brands or the way they connect with brands. And over the course of the last few years is when the advertising world started really transforming. So communication started first with digital, then it was uh, the ability to get content, information, news, and then of course came along advertising. Right. And so that's changed our advertising model completely. Yeah. Yeah. Because you know, when I started in this role, probably 98% of our advertising was in, in TV. Yeah, and uh, what is it now? And now, now I would say we're probably about a third of our of our advertising is in digital, and then we still have a fairly high amount, you know, sixty percent or so right. in in the TV world. Right. But um, so that's a pretty big shift, right? As as you can well yeah. imagine. And, and just to give our viewers a sense mm -hmm. of the scale you're talking about, mm -hmm. you know, worldwide. What is a ballpark number for the amount of dollars that you push through marketing channels? Well, I, I can't give you an exact number, but we're the world's biggest advertiser. So you know that. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, very, it's very, very big. I mean, we, we literally reach, uh, we serve between four and a half and five billion consumers around the world. So that's we serve, a very large platform. It's a very large platform. Yeah. Because yeah. these are products that people use every day. So for you to yeah. take advantage of the innovations of the valley and mm -hmm. the innovations of the technology industry, mm -hmm. you need them, you need those products and services from technology to really have scale. Yes. And in fact, that's when it started getting really interesting. You know, when I uh, first started in this role, 
we had a little bit of a relationship with Google because we were doing some search work. They hadn't bought YouTube yet. Uh, we just started getting interested in, in uh, Facebook. Uh -huh. In fact, in 2000, I guess 2007, we ran our first ad with Facebook and they had like mm -hmm. 9 million users. One of the things you have to um, temper is doing innovative things, trying new things, mm -hmm. but with the sort of requisite that you need scale. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have four and a half billion consumers, that's a big platform. So how do you work with the startup? How do you identify a company that, oh, this one might be one that yeah. we can scale with? I mean, it's almost like you're a venture capitalist trying to pick a winner. Well, what we have, we have a, uh, a, a group that, that has gotten together that has figured out that the best way to do this is first start with our business units, our brands. Our brands then figure out what is a, a, a consumer need that we need to meet or, and or a business hypothesis. Then what we do is we go scan to see what startups might be available to help us out. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then what that allows us to do is to narrow it down and then do some you know, briefs and pitches to be able to take it from there. You know, often tech companies, at least they have a history of sort of saying it's my way or the highway. Mm -hmm. You know, here's our ad unit. You know, here's our display ad, or yep. here's our pre-roll. Um, are you finding that, that startups now, particularly those that are really early but have gotten scale with users, are coming and saying, let's talk about the best way to execute yeah. the idea of advertising on this platform? Yeah, that's, that's really the ones, the, the winners are the ones, the ones that do that. That's what, why our Facebook um, uh, joint business relationship became so successful is because we, we deeply understood how the ads how the user used it. So we wanted to go into video for, for several several years, and we pushed them, you know, uh, and of course they knew they had to get into video. And, uh, but what they, they helped us understand is that the user experience is you're whipping through your feed. Right. So it's, you know, 1.7 to 3 seconds. Yep. So we need to now figure out So that's, how to, to me, that. maybe when you think about this transformation that mm -hmm. you mentioned at the beginning. Yeah. You know, P&G is the best at in the world at making a 30 second spot. Mm -hmm. It really is. I mean, every time you run a reel, I like, it's tear jerkers, right? It's <laughs> like, oh my God, that's such good work. Yep. But is part of the transformation, particularly given your role at the company, how do I get into the consumer behavior that isn't about lean back and give me the 30 second uh -huh. ad, but lean forward and make and hook me in a second? The idea there is that you want to think about you have all these, these mediums now that you can express your brand's personality and different aspects of your brand's personality. So what you want to do is think about how to express your brand as a masterpiece, paint a masterpiece across this wide creative canvas. So that's going to include 30 second ads. That's going to include two minute, three minute videos. Right. It's going to include five second, six second videos. It's going to include three second videos. It's going to include posts. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, it'll start to include virtual reality and, and, uh, and chat bots, chats and, and texts and those kinds of and, things. And yeah. VR and augmented reality. Yep. Now, I imagine that this causes a bit of anxiety because the, it's one thing to have an entire infrastructure built to execute on television ads and get really mm -hmm. good at that, yep. and have a set of agency partners who are really good at that. It's yep. another to have fifteen different parts that make up a pastiche of a canvas, mm -hmm. and a lot of stuff gets made. You mentioned uh, in your talk at Signal, uh, and I thought it was quite actually revealing and frank. You said, mm -hmm. we put out a lot of crap. Oh, yeah. Um, well, it's not usual you get the head of brand at a major corporation saying, here's some examples of stuff we've done that are awful. That, that, that's part of facing reality. I mean, that's the... You know, the one thing, the one thing you learn from, from the world we live in now is that you, you've got to be straight about things and assess when you're good and when you're not, right. and, then, and then pivot and change. And so what happened during that, uh, at, you talked about anxiety. Right. Yeah, it was a pretty big shift. Yeah. And in that shift, there were, there were, you know, there were a few things that we, we did that weren't that great. In fact, you know, I joked about this, which is that I guess we thought in the, in the, the real-time, you know, digital marketing age, what we needed to do is just produce thousands and thousands of ads right. and change them exponentially all the time. Unfortunately, that produced a lot of crap. Right. 
And uh, so what we have, have done is we stopped the noise, decided to raise the bar on creativity, focus on what is the brand idea, what does the brand stand for, and then find ways to express that brand based on how the user is going to interact in that particular medium. Yeah. You know, in the work that I've seen that is the most impactful, it seems to have at its core almost a cause, hmm. a calling, a, a, yeah. a, a, a purpose, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, what we in the tech industry call speeds and feeds, you know, features, you yeah. know, this will make your hair shiny, this will, well, you have yeah. to say all that, but, yep. but at the end of the day, there is this purpose. Well, the core of the creative canvas does need to start with the, uh, what the brand is, is stands for and what the brand delivers. And so Pantene is a great example. Pantene, the, the, the idea behind Pantene is strong is beautiful, which you could probably you can take it in a lot Say, of ways. Take it in a lot of ways, yeah. exactly. And we, and we have ads that show how the product works. And we have how-to videos that show how you can get different hairstyles using, using different types of, of products. We have what we did on the Super Bowl, which was Dad Do. Right. Which was where these football players are doing their daughter's, daughter's hair. Right. You know, and I, I have three daughters, so yeah. I've done a lot of little ponies yeah. and a lot of dad dudes. <laughs> That's and about you, all You need I'm strong hair to be able to do it exactly. <laughs> I'm still bad. I, my ponies are always over here, so they're, they're really not very great. But, uh, but, but that has been the reason why is because we found an insight that uh, daughters that spend time with their dads are more confident and they feel stronger. And so it has an emotional connection as well. Like a girl on Always, Always is a feminine protection brand that right. is about confidence. Right. And uh, so what we've done is we've found some insights where uh, half of girls significantly drop, their, their confidence significantly drops during puberty. Right. And there's lots of reasons for that, but one of the reasons is that demeaning comments like, you do that like a girl. So we decided we're going to change that. Right. We're going to make like a girl mean amazing I think things. It's interesting because I saw, I saw the research. Mm -hmm. In fact, you did change the perception. Did change that. And and yes. so here's a, you know, a consumer packaged goods company, yep. you know, which is in the business of making quarterly profits and, mm -hmm. you know, selling um, uh, you know, one could argue pretty commodity products to uh, to a large group of people, but here's a company that has changed the perception of what it means to be a girl. Right. In society. Yep. Did you set out to do that? Well, I think yeah, I, th I think we really, we, we did because, you know, these, while these products are kind of everyday household and personal care products, they're actually very personal. They're very right. intimate. They're right. part of your everyday life. Right. And, and what we have found is that when our brands can connect to something personal and connect to something emotional, connect to something that's relevant in popular culture, we can make a difference. Yeah. We can make a difference in how they feel about themselves, we can make a difference how they feel about others, and we can make a difference, of course, how they feel about the brand, while yeah. providing also the product. So this one was a classic example where 90% of, of, of women and girls felt that like a girl was a, was a positive thing before we did this. After we did like a girl, 200 million views later, 76% felt that like a girl meant, a po meant positive things. That's, that's, a, that's a remarkable change. And the brand's remarkable. growing. Yeah. I actually like the word advertising. It mm -hmm. means, the Latin root advert means to turn toward. Yeah. So that's why, and that's what we do. Right. We get people to turn toward our brands right. in whatever messaging we come up with. Dollar Shave Club, mm -hmm. which sort of came out of nowhere and became a, a player in one of uh, the businesses that's an important business for P&G, mm -hmm. um, was acquired by Unilever, which mm -hmm. is probably your you know, only peer when it comes mm -hmm. to uh, the category that you play in. Um, they don't have a shaving business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you do. Mm -hmm. uh, how did you respond when you heard that news? Well, I, you know, as, as you would expect, um, you know, oh, that, that, that's an interesting move. Yeah. Um, you know, the, uh, the, I think but the, the, the most important response is, is for us, us thinking about the consumer uh, and what the consumer wants. If anything, mm -hmm. that's, that's probably the, uh, the biggest discussions that we're having right now is about, okay, what, is this, what does this mean for the consumer? Because when you finally see one of those being, being acquired by uh, a startup like that being acquired by, by a big company, you start thinking about, it's, you know, a bit of a bit of an inflection point. Right. 
and I think what's really important for us is to think about what are consumers looking for? They, consumers want their products available in a range of different places. Right. Direct to consumer, which is what that is, e-commerce, and traditional retail. And our job is to make sure it's available everywhere. And it's right. probably the unique aspect of everyday household and personal care products. It's the fact that they are really, you're talking about billions of people, there's actually a lot of switching. Uh -huh. And there's a lot of ways in which they want to buy their products. Right. So that's what, that's what we're thinking about right w now. W you know, dollar shave in the terms of, you know, 50 mile radius of where we're sitting mm -hmm. is, a is a sort of classic disruptor. Mm -hmm. they, they came in, they didn't have manufacturing, they didn't have R&D, they didn't have yep. any of those traditional costs. They didn't spend money on advertising. They made a viral YouTube video. Yep. Um, they had a direct-to-consumer model. Uh, almost everything about it was something that uh, a traditional company maybe didn't want to do because it wasn't the way a traditional company yeah. set up. It's a yeah. classic example of Silicon Valley disruption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How does a company like P&G become the disruptor instead of the dis disruptee? It's what I said before, which is going to sound you know, very, very trite, but it's really important, is that understand what the consumer wants. Because at the end of the day, what's happening here is taking friction out of the system. Right. Okay, it's a, it's a friction, more frictionless experience because it's direct. And, and what it is, is it's, what we're, what we're doing now with every one of our businesses is thinking about, okay, what does the consumer want? What do they not like about the experience? What are they? What opportunities might it provide? I mean, you just saw we just we just announced the fact that we're going out with Tide Wash Club. Yeah. Well, Tide Wash Club is an example of, you know, how, making it easier for the consumer to be able to get their laundry detergent. Right. And um, and we've already got prestige businesses that that are direct to consumer because yeah. that that allows you a little deeper sale. Yeah. Because you're able to go where you where you can't do that in in many cases. Yeah. So that's really what. Disruption occurs when you think about how how the consumer experience either is changing or needs to change. Right. The culture required in a company to stay not only current but looking over the next hill. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel like there's also a cultural shift internal to the company that's required? And and would you say that that shift is underway under David Taylor, the new CEO? Absolutely. We're, we're, what, we're, what our jobs to do as leaders is to see around the corners, right. see, where, see where things are going, and then create the conditions that enable people to experiment, try different things, and then scale up things as quickly as possible. And right. that's precisely what we're doing right, right. now. Right. Yeah. Well, Mark Pritchard, thank you so much for coming by. You're welcome. Thank you. It was a pleasure. The Nuco Shift Dialogues are produced in partnership with the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center, connecting entrepreneurs from all walks of life.